Um, we'll start today in a minute with, with, with the climate change and, and uh, with input from some of my colleagues, I, I put together a, a PowerPoint where we go through some of the background of, of climate change. I think many of you in this room already know much of what, I, what I'm going to say, but anyway, as a background, we'll go through that. Um, where we're looking at, at how the how rainfall is changing, how patterns are changing between dry and wet areas and so on. But the, the main impact of that is, of course, the impact on the rivers, on the hydrology, right? So how do you translate changes in weather into changes in availability of, of water? And that's where hydrological modeling comes in. So after the climate change, it'll be uh, rather general on, on hydrological modeling uh, up until lunchtime, and then a bit more specific after lunch. So I'll, uh, I'll go through the hydrological modeling in general, as I mentioned, but then we take one specific model, which is, uh, which is applied a lot, a lot around the world, and go through how does this actually work? What, what, how do you model the different processes? Uh, and this is not the most advanced in the world, but one which is very much used in practical issues, right? So we'll go through that. Um, since modeling is not the subject of this course, as I mentioned, we're not going to have exercises in that kind of modeling. But still, I put in a little exercise. Uh, we have made a tool, this, this model called NAM, that Sanjay Kumar knows well, um, that, uh, uh, we, uh, that we, are, we are applying a lot at, at DHI. And there's a little tool that's called the NAM calibrator, uh, where you can actually see the impact of changing parameters very easily. So I'll, I'll show that later, and the idea is that you should try this. Um, so that we should move to a computer lab. I don't know where that is. Uh, we'll find out. And then sit there in the afternoon, and, and then you have a chance to apply this yourself. And in general, I've put in different exercises during the week, um, also so I don't have to talk for eight hours every day. So that's basically today. Um, now, when we, when we work around the world, um, I used to say that, that whenever you have a project dealing with water resources somewhere, you're setting up models, you're looking into different issues, 90% of the time is spent on data and 10% of actual modeling and actual reporting and so on. Because data, there's all sorts of problems with data. Data is wrong. Uh, data, there's not enough data, uh, data doesn't represent what you want it to represent. There's all these problems all the time, right? So I'm actually planning that all of tomorrow we're going to spend on data. Uh, looking into uh, the, the practical issues that you face when you're actually working out there. So that may not be very academic, but if you don't have data to describe nature the way you want it, then forget about all your advanced modeling tools and all your t uh, technologies and whatever, whatever you have then it doesn't help, right? If you don't, if you can't describe nature and actually come up with a solution, it doesn't help at all. So, um, so we're gonna look into data and information, the importance of that. Uh, of course, also a bit on climate change in relation to this. And uh, here I am also uh, introducing you a little bit to, to some of the tools that we are using. I cannot leave those tools with you, unfortunately. Uh, but, but at least to get some idea of how can you work with data, what kind of uh, analysis can you make, how, how can you take both your GIS data and your time series data and, and get, improve your own overview of that kind of thing. Right? So, um, so we'll, we'll make some exercises with, with those also tomorrow in the lab, I hope, if it works. Um, Wednesday is then on river basin management. So there'll be a, uh, a presentation in the morning on, on well, again, a bit on modeling techniques and when, we, when we're walk, talking about river basins. So this is, uh, this is looking into the water use. You have reservoirs here and there. You have a town that needs water. You have um, irrigation. There is uh, hydropower. There are all these different water uses. And if anything, 
the demands are increasing. I don't think I've heard of any demands that go down, actually, not in total anyway, right? Um, so how do, we, how do we ensure that everybody gets the water they want uh, or, or, or they need? Can we change, can we convince them to change their demands so they don't need that much? Um, how, do we, uh, how do we share the water of a river basin that crosses uh, international borders or here in India just state borders? which you all know have been an issue for decades in, uh, in many Indian states, right, or between states. So is that possible at all? And what are the tools available? Uh, so I'm going to go through some examples where we have been working with these kind of problems here in India, but also uh, elsewhere um, as, as inspiration and, and looking into that. And then we have made something at DHI, um, which is a bit unusual for what we normally do. We have made a game, a, uh, a computer game called Aqua Republica. So this is what's called a serious game. So it's not just you know, shooting the bad guys. Uh, this is a game where, where you are then the manager of a river basin. And you have all the issues that are there. You have uh, people need food, people need uh, power. Uh, some years are wet, some years are dry. And then you need to take some decisions. Uh, do we... Uh, do we construct uh, a new factory to make money for the people because we're running out of money? Do we, um, do we build a dam? What, what do we do? How do we handle this? Right? And, and th this game takes you through that and then suddenly it tells you, now there was a very dry year. Now what are you going to do? Right? Um, exactly how we'll do it. We'll find out. Uh, maybe you group up in computers. We'll see how the computer room works and so on. But that's, that will be the exercise for, for Wednesday. Okay. Yeah. On, on Thursday, <coughs> we start by looking into floods. So flood modeling, uh, forecasting. Um, how, how do we work with that? This has been a key issue for DHI as long as I've been there. Uh, and, and they're keeping... Uh, projects of improving forecasting systems, of, of making more detailed flood uh, plans, flood management plans in different parts of the world and so on. And I'm sure that's going to be all over India also for the next decades. Uh, so floods in the morning, but also drought uh, management, um, seasonal planning and so on. Uh, looking into practical issues of, of, of both of those uh, on the same day. And uh, and then I'll introduce you to another tool, which is um, which we call our, our uh, flood and drought portal. Uh, there are lots of satellite-based information available out there, from uh, some from Indian satellites, but from US, from Europe, from whatever uh, rainfall that are measured, uh, soil water measurements, uh, indicators of how the vegetation is doing, and so on. And a lot of these, uh, a lot of this data is uh, free. You can just uh, download it and use it for whatever you want. What we have done at DHI is that we have uh, set up a system that goes out and grabs all this data and puts it in the same portal. So you have access to a lot of this data at the same location and you can download it also. Uh, there are uh, measurements of rainfall, for example, uh, from satellite, the TRMM was the tropical mission monitoring, whatever, something has been running for a long time, now being replaced by something called GPM, which is more detailed, both in, in time and space. Um, and there are other rainfall uh, monitoring. And data like that can just be uh, pulled down. One of you was just asking me, uh, what do I do on the project that I had uh, on this Indian river that comes down from Tibet and Nepal, because I don't know anything about those countries and I won't get any data. Uh, so in a portal like that, you can just grab it. I mean, you can, you can take this data. Of course, it's not measured on the ground, but it's still data. We'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that. So I'll introduce you to this portal, and uh, I think I've set up some, some passwords that we can, that we can use uh, during that. Okay. Yeah, and on, on Friday here it says overview of flood and drought management, future trends, and so on. My thinking was a little bit that we'll, 
we will not um, we will see what's required uh, during the week we may be spending more time on this and this time on that and so on um, so there may on Friday be an interest for why don't we talk more about this subject or we, we focus on something else so, so keep it a little bit open um, it may also be that some of those exercises that you've been doing that you want to spend more time on that so maybe on Friday you say Let, let's go back in the lab because while I'm still here uh, some of these, uh, these this flood and drought monitoring portal once you set up the passwords I think we'll just leave them with Jamya and if Jamya wants to share them with you uh, fine with me right so so some of those you can also use in your further research or, or whatever you're you're working with right so uh, and you can then also download so so maybe that'll be one of the things we want to do on Friday but let's see how it goes it's not the program is a bit tentative so uh, if when, when it's lunch time we stop for lunch and so on whether it's according to the program or not right so so let's see how it goes I'm very open to questions uh, at any time also during tea uh, though okay on occasionally during tea I need to prepare for the next but anyway we'll uh, we'll see how it goes when I was teaching at AIT 20 years ago um, well I, I come from in, in Denmark where I come from let me start with that when 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 you teach students uh, very often uh, in the middle of a sentence you'll see one of the students hand doing like this and then he said what do you want and, and the student said but why is it like that sir why, why? No, they don't even say sir in Denmark they say hands right so why is it like that that's a bit strange I don't understand couldn't you say more a bit more about that and then the teacher will do that and then all the, the teacher had planned to go through this but at the end of the day you only go through this much because then you're discussing this particular subject but it doesn't matter then you pick up the next time right and and in this way the students are involved you have this interaction and you you avoid that that miss if if the teacher says something that's not understood you avoid that they all just sit there and say and, and are blank right that it, it actually you, you improves the uh, the understanding that at, when I started at AIT teaching I, I told the students please ask because you know I've, I've been with working in this for so long I don't I've forgotten what is difficult and what is easy right? uh, so sometimes I'd be just saying something and nobody understands anything at all and it's a waste of my time and your time that I just talk I never got a single question uh, and that's very cultural I mean I know it's, it's in, in India but in Asia as such you don't you don't interrupt the teacher and and maybe also you don't want to show that I didn't understand right yeah yeah whatever but they, I mean ties are a, a small part of it. it's all over Asians and so on um, so it never happened but it is useful uh, of course and you're not many of you are not students so we're all adults so I, I'm, I'm very open to any time we stop and we just discuss something right uh, it, like I said it's not a fixed program okay I think that's probably it um, I'll, no, I'll, I'll do. I'll, I'll handle this one, please. Yeah. Um, even though I'm losing the mic whenever I sit down. Yeah, I thought I would just. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'll just go through a brief introduction of DHI. Um, just, just shortly. So, so DHI is uh, yeah, an independent and private organization and like I mentioned earlier we're, we don't work for profit uh, so we can spend whatever profit there might be internally on research and development we have 80% uh, of our more than 1,000 employees with, uh, uh, with a master's or PhD and we've been around since 1964 and maybe let me just tell you that story uh, what, what happened was that um, in, in Denmark where we have a coast along the the, uh, the North Sea um, they were planning to build a harbor and that particular coast is sandy and the current is generally going north so there's a lot of sand transport along the coast so if you make a harbor there in no time the sand will just deposit where, where the water is, where, where there's no current right so if that will close the entry to the harbor and engineering companies in Denmark at the time they didn't really know how to handle that uh, so nobody wanted to volunteer to actually try to solve that um, but then 
there were some professors at the Technical University of, of Denmark who said that they thought they might be able to figure out, but it would take a lot of physical modeling and studies and so on, and they didn't have the time for that. Uh, so the government said, okay, what we do now is we create this company we call Danish Hydraulic Institute, and the three of you are the only employees, and here is your first project. Um, this is the money for that, and if you manage to solve this, then while you're doing that, maybe you manage to get another project which can then keep you going. If not, then that's the end of that. Right. So they worked with that for a few years and got that project, uh, and the harbor is still there. Uh, and they got another project and another project and another. So, so that was the start of what, like I said, what's what called Danish Hydraulic Institute. We don't use that anymore. Now it's just DHI, because hydraulic doesn't cover what we do. Um, we we'll just move on here. So we're, we're global with offices around the world, including India, uh, and work with all these areas. So, so hydraulic is still in there, both in, on land, surface, uh, surface water, and, and coastal areas. But we work with aquaculture, for example, uh, climate change, urban water, products that are environment, uh, with environmental risk, and so on. So it's water in all environments, not just uh, along the harbors and so on. Water so many places, right? We kept DHI because the, that name was known, but no longer hydraulic. Uh, solutions are the practical projects that we work with around the world. And then we have the academy with training and, and our software. Um, this mic software being a, a key area with models for uh, oceans and three dimensions for uh, catchment areas like Mike Xi and Mike Hydro and so on, flooding, urban areas like that. And Mike Operations, which is used to control models and in, in real-time systems, uh, uh, real-time forecasting or planning systems and so on, controlling the data. Uh, some part of Mike Operations is what we're going to work with uh, tomorrow afternoon. So ha having all these training courses, uh, Many are, are standard courses, but others are also uh, more tailored. And then serious games are mentioned down, mentioned down here. Yeah, increasing or more or less stable uh, turnover, like that. And then we cooperate with universities like, like Jamia here, but also Global Water Partnership, UNIP, uh, and other organizations around the world. OK, so that was a brief introduction to DHI. And then we will look into climate change. <coughs> so it says here climate change and extreme precipitation, which is a bit the, the focus on this one. It's uh, uh, Henrik Massen is uh, a colleague of mine who has been working with R&D within climate change for 10, 20 years, I think, by now. So we're going to look a bit into climate change projections and, and impact analysis. And then an example from my country, Denmark, Copenhagen. Um, but we're looking just in general on the, on the major impacts here. Um, it's, it's still, there are still people, including the President of the United States, who doubt climate change. Uh, but I think all scientists that are really working with this are, are in no doubt anymore. They are convinced that this is, uh, this is taking place. And now the question is just, how bad is it going to be? Right. But some of the major impacts which are, are generally agreed, at least among the scientists, is that the, uh, the contrast in precipitation in between wet and dry will increase. So that's both in the regions. A dry regions will often tend to be drier. Wet regions will tend to be wetter. But also between seasons. Uh, so when you have your wet seasons, you get even more water. When you have your dry seasons, there's even less. Right? And so the, the total amount of water may be the same in a given area. But if the distribution over the year is different, it, it causes a problem in itself. You may have reservoirs that are, uh, that are set up for the current situation. And if that changes, you are not ready for it. I was living two years at, uh, in uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, uh, heading the DHI's uh, Department of Water Resources there. 
And while I was there, uh, in, what, in, in, in Malaysia it rains all the time, all year round. They don't really have a, a wet and a dry season, but still they have periods with less rain and periods with a bit of more rain. So typically here, now January, February, it rains less than normal. And in the Kuala Lumpur area, there were six weeks without rain. Six weeks. I mean, here you have seven months, right? We, were, we had uh, uh, the water supply to our houses was cut down. There were many, uh, many houses where they only had water every second day in, in Kuala Lumpur, which is a, you know, a modern city and, and a relatively well-doing country. They just didn't have enough storage capacity um, for, to just handle six weeks of no rainfall. Right? Because they're not used to it. Here in India, you're building huge reservoirs because you know there's a, it's not going to rain until June. Right? And so. But that's going to change. Um, extreme precipitation will become more intense and frequent. In, um, in Denmark, as I will show, we've already actually changed our recommendations on what is the 10 year flood. The official 10 year flood uh, a rainfall has, has uh, increased. So drought intensity and duration will increase, and, and you see increased activity of cyclones. Um, we're hearing about these cyclones in America and, and, and of course, in this, this part of the world also regularly. And they don't come every year, right? I mean, they're still, uh, particularly the very bad ones, there are still many years between them. And that will, of course, continue. So at the time when we have enough statistical material to say we can now statistically prove that the number of cyclones has increased in this area. That's probably 100 year, years away because it's so rare still. Right? So while this change is taking place, we can't really convince uh, Donald Trump and others that this is actually happening right? because weather changes from year to year. Right? Weather and climate is not the same thing. Mean sea level is going up. Yeah, um, I think many of you have also seen these. Um, uh, we have the IPCC making these assessment reports uh, at regular interval where they come out with the, um, the expectations of, of how climate is going to vary. And this is the one that was valid um, up until relatively recently with different scenarios from 2000 to, 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 to 2100. Uh, different scenarios were calculated. They have now changed that approach and, and are, are describing um, what they call RCP scenarios. So this is, this is related to the radiation. I mean, I think many of you know that if we didn't have an atmosphere around the, the Earth, the average temperature would be minus 15 or something like that. We have we have this atmosphere with a greenhouse effect, which is good, because otherwise we wouldn't be here. Um, and what happens is that the radiation from the sun comes in and heats the, the, the ground. Um, that heat doesn't stay. It is then, in long waves, radiated back into, the, into space again, basically. right? But some of it is retained because of the greenhouse effect, because of the CO2 and other gases that are out there. Um, and and this difference is what increases the temperature so that it's bearable to be here. Um, if you compare to 1800, um, and that's what they sort of said in, in this, or I think it's actually 1750. That is sort of the zero level. So before industries came, when, when the, there was no impact, you can say, or very small impact from people on, on climate. And then in relation to that, there are different scenarios made. We are already here where the, on CO, CO2 emission rate, we already increased a lot through the 1900. Um, and, and different scenarios have now been, been set up where the most optimistic is that we manage to change this within a few years, reduce it, and come down here. Uh, that still has a 2.6, and that is a 2.6 increase um, in the atmosphere's capacity to retain radiation, you could say, compared to 1800. Because it has already increased. Even though we do all this, we can't, we can't go back to zero. That's too late. This one requires an awful lot of action around the world right now, and which is probably unrealistic. I mean, you, you, uh, 
that, that we, we stop emission completely. Somebody needs to invent something very cheap, uh, cl clean energy tomorrow to do this, more or less. Hopefully, a more realistic one is the 4.5 here, um, which requires a change. When is the, I think the maximum is maybe 2030 or so, and then it goes down again. But there's also others, and a quite pessimistic one up here. Right? How it will go remains to be seen, and, and that's up to Donald Trump and all the others. <coughs> so, looking at how, how will this then affect things, well here, here we have temperature in the optimistic change where it only goes up by uh, less than one degree in most of the world, or the very pessimistic one where we have uh, a very significant increase in temperature, in average temperature. If you look at uh, precipitation changes, uh, a bit similar that, that they're modest in the, in the optimistic scenario and in some parts of the world quite severe. Looks like India is a plus 10, 20 or so uh, percent in, in, uh, in average rainfall. Again, there might be uh, the distribution between the, the, uh, the years may be different. So, what, what we are often interested in is what happens here where I live. In my village, how is this going to impact me or uh, locally here in the stream where I, we take the water that we are drinking, what will the, what's the consequences for me? Right. And that's a bit difficult because um, what, what we start with are these uh, global climate models um, that that are considering the whole Earth, right? And in a rather coarse scale, uh, what is the uh, uh, calculating how, how uh, climatic uh, uh, patterns might change in that? And that needs to be translated into what happens on local scale. I think maybe the next slide, yeah, illustrates it, at least some of the processes better, that, that we're having these global circulation models uh, covering the entire Earth, but, but the grids here are very coarse, which means that, that you can't use these to actually assess what happened locally. So what you do in step one is that you make a regional climatic model, so still on the weather, this is, we don't talk water yet, so on, the, on how the weather uh, performs, we have a regional model here, and along these boundaries, you then take data from the, from the global models. So down here it comes in from here. So the boundary conditions of, of these regional models are then decided by the global models, and then the regional models in a finer grid then calculates, well, how will the climate then change here? Um, so going, uh, going down in scale, but then that's still not enough. Yeah, so here is an example where you can see this, that, that the grids are here quite coarse, and then you go into much more detail in the regional models. Um, so as a basis for, for the hydrological impact assessment, these regional models are then at, a, at a, a, an appropriate scale, you could say. <coughs> um, so we were taking these yeah, large scale models. Um, <laughs> Is that me or what? Maybe I should put my phone away. Um, so we're downscaling yeah, in, in time and space for the impact studies. And from this one, uh, we, we use a statistical downscaling to come down to the local production. And this is basically looking, taking the data which is available in the area that you look at, the, the rainfall data there, and then see what does this downscaled model, what does that produce a rainfall? And sometimes you find there's a bias that generally is 20% too high. Right? So statistically, you can then just correct it uh, based on measurements on the ground and then, uh, and then get it more realistic. Sorry for intervention. Uh, basically, in regions uh, like the mountainous regions, our is uh, northwestern and northern region. Yes, we are facing this downscaling problem, geographical. What could be the lowest geographical grid 
up to which we can go for this uh, special down spinning? It depends on the model modeling tools you, you have available. And I think research is continuing to make it even more detailed and better and so on. It's getting better uh, gradually. And of course, uh, if, if, you're, if the current models are not giving you the, the uh, accuracy that, that, that you need, well, then you must wait or hope for, for, for better tools. It's an area of research that will continue for many years and needs to get better. Um, and, and of course, uncertain, uncertainties in these uh, uh, climate predictions is also making it more difficult for scientists to convince the politicians that this is actually real, right? Because there are still, there are still many of these uncertainties going on. And it, in, in Kashmir and these areas, it's, uh, it's not easy. That's true. Um, yeah, another example here of, of just a change in, in mean precipitation now in, in northern Europe. Um, I come from Denmark, which is here. But in, in, uh, yeah, in the mean precipitation here and in extreme values where it's up to a factor two uh, increase in the extreme precipitation. Um, so the uncertainty that, that I just mentioned in connection with you, um, with your question here, there are a whole cascade of, of issues that, that contribute to this uncertainty. I mean, there is the, uh, uh, there's a future society. Well, what will, um, how will, how will it look in the future, just in 10 years from now? What is the population? How, what are we doing? How are we, uh, what is the, uh, the way we work? What are the emissions of greenhouse gases? Uh, there are the uncertainties in the climate model that we just discussed, um, which are then, and, and one here is depending on the, on the next, right? The regional scenarios, the impact model, the local, and so on. Uh, so whenever there's a new step in our analysis or in our data and information, it adds to the uncertainty, right? Mm -hmm. uh, global models are available perfectly right here also. Is there any source from where we get the downscaling model for Ikea? Yeah, and I'll show you that on Thursday. <coughs> yeah, so, uh, oops. So often what you do, uh, downscale here, but there, there often there are many different models. There are di different global models, there are different regional models. So what, at least what we do at DHI sometimes is, Rather than select one, we select and hold an whole ensemble, several of these, and, and then uh, use all of these to see what do they say, to get an idea of the spread also. What is the uncertainty in this? And here, for example, is the change in, preci in extreme precipitation uh, by the end of the century uh, for a 10-year for event. And as you can see, it's very different. Like this one, uh, this particular combination is expecting an increase of uh, one and a half or so in, in average, whereas this one is only saying 0 0.8 or so. Um, so often this, yeah, unfortunately, is showing us it, this is still very uncertain and you can't really say anything. Right? Nevertheless, we have uh, in Denmark decided to change the IDF curves, intensity, duration, frequency, or rainfall. So this is the, the rainfall intensity um, and, uh, and, and duration. And, the, and this, I think, is a 10-year. I think this is the curve for a 10-year rainfall event. So, so an intensity of 10 uh, millimeters per second um, with a duration of, of 10 minutes is here. right? So you can use these uh, to in, in this, uh, for design rainfall for, for a given area. Um, if, if you want to design for a 10-year event, well, you take them out of these curves. So the, the, the current or the one that was there is, uh, is this one. But then the mean future and high future, depending on which of these uh, climate models and other tools you use, are these other ones. And, and uh, uh, th th they are already now being applied in... Uh, in many parts of Denmark. So there's an example here of, of flooding for, in an urban area for, for a high rainfall event. <coughs> um, 
using the uh, using the designed event basically now or of the mean and the high uh, in future. Um, so what has happened here is that we've just been running a model, uh, taking that rainfall, put it on, on that uh, particular area, and then see what flooding it, it creates considering uh, the local infrastructure and, and so on. Um, yeah, and, and what do you do about it then? I mean, when you have these very high rainfall events, or expect them to come, what, what should you do about it? In Copenhagen, they have started. Um, there's also, I mean, partly because of the understanding that climate change is, uh, is coming and so on, but there were some very heavy rainfall events actually by chance or within the last 10 years uh, in, in Copenhagen. Whether they had come anyway, nobody knows, right? But it, it raised the awareness in the minds of people uh, having to drain their cellars and whatever uh, of, of water, that this is a problem, right? So the support, political support is there also to do something about it. And what has happened here, uh, or is happening, is a, a combination of many different uh, measures at the same time. And I think that's also what, when, if you're working with flooding problems around the world, you'll often find that it's not just one solution. Right? It's a combination of different things that needs to be done. So there are local retention uh, in different areas where you have a possibility of, of retaining the flood water, storing it there temporarily, maybe just for half an hour. In a, in a, in a city, you don't need that much time, right? So when, just at the time when the very heavy rain occurs, if you can just store it temporarily uh, for 10 minutes somewhere before you let it into the sewers or the whatever, then there's a chance that, that other water can have moved away and you don't get it to spill. Uh, additional storages, uh, we have some old lakes here which were actually constructed um, artificially for the defense of the old Copenhagen some hundred years ago. Um, so, but the lakes are still there and one of the suggestions is to take this particular lake and then just lower the level. So you would, you would uh, in normal conditions, some of the of this, uh, lake bed would be uh, a park, basically. You would turn it into a park and, and, and a low lake, but whenever there's too much water in the sewer system or in the streets, you fill up that old lake again. Get people out of the park and fill it up. You'll be destroying the park a bit, but compared to the damage happening inside people's houses, that's nothing. Right? Um, so there are some roads that will be conveyance uh, corridors, and there's a tunnel, I think that's this one, <coughs> being constructed also. Um, so combining all these uh, different tools, and of course, in the design of that kind of thing, you need uh, models to, um, to test different solutions, and, and, uh, and there would be models of, of both hydrology in, in the urban area, so what happens when the rain falls, but you need the roads as rivers, you need the sewers, how much can they handle, and whatever tunnels you have, and all this in the same model, basically, to, to look into uh, how these things work. Uh, again, on, a bit on the, uh, on the design criteria. So the current guideline is here. This is between what is the return period in future climate and what is the return period on the present climate. So yeah, if nothing changed, this would be the line. Right? And this is a 10, 100,000 uh, year event, you could say. Uh, so already now it's changed. Uh, so it, it, we are designing for what we expect will be the future in, in Denmark. Right? But if you went for that, for some of these uh, very severe scenarios, it, it would be even worse. So we are, we are hoping and expecting that the world will manage to keep it below these uh, very pessimistic scenarios, uh, at least for now. You can also discuss, do you want to is it wise to design for the worst possible future? Uh, it's very expensive, right? I mean, there's, if you really want to make everything flood proof, it's an awful lot of money that you spend. So what, what is often applied instead is that you look into, are there any uh, no regrets decisions? I mean, are anything that if you do this, it'll help, and you will do this anyway, right? even if the climate doesn't change. Then you start with those. 
Um, and then you can look into, okay, we, what can we do just for the next 10, 20 years? Which also maybe is not too expensive. Then you do that for a while. And then if it keeps being worse, then again you take another step. Like that. But it's a good idea to think that process through from the beginning. Um, and then look into these different scenarios of how worse it gets to see how can, you, how can we maybe uh, make a plan for, say, for the flood control that doesn't require an awful lot of investment now but can be taken in steps and still uh, do that safely so that as things change and, and, uh, and floods occur that we are still reasonably prepared for this. So politics comes into this also, of course, but... but um, it's good to go think through these scenarios. Yeah, a few uh, numbers here on the expected damage. Uh, if, if we continue with uh, business as usual, so we don't really change anything, well, in, in relation to the current damage, then in 2001, with current guidelines, it would be almost double with uh, these different scenarios uh, even worse. Um, if we then fully implement this uh, cloudburst plan that I just mentioned, we would actually be down to, uh, a factor 10 on the, on the present, with the present climate. But if, um, if this RCP 8.1 comes, we're, we're actually back to the same <coughs> amount of annual damage as we have at the moment. Um, and, and for sea surge, the present will not really change, uh, but a factor of six uh, in, in, uh, in uh, some 80 years from now, um, if we don't do anything. We have made some guides um, on climate change. Uh, water resources, urban, ma uh, marine, collecting some of the recommendations that we have in general from DHI and background knowledge and so on. Um, these can be downloaded from here. Uh, let me leave this on for a while. Um, I think you have to register your name, but there's no price. So you can just, uh, you can just take them if you want. Um, so, so we can, uh, yeah, go through this if you want at some point. What is the... So let's see, we're planning a lunch at 1.30 at the moment. Yeah, so this is more or less on time. Did you get the address? That was wonder. Okay, I think that's it for, for climate change in general. And like I said, we can discuss during the week, but if there are any questions just now, on these things. The uh, first one was here. Okay, I, I think you are going to cover the satellite data on Wednesday. Satellite data on, yeah, Wednesday, Thursday. Are you covering the how to assemble those data set and how to do bias correction on the process? Not really the bias correction, not, not, not more than, than here. But, but like I said, the, the, um, I mean, you, going from the global model to the climate, to the regional model is a measure of, that's a, you ask a, uh, IMD, right? Uh, on the um, the rest of it is relatively simple statistics. So. Sir, I'd like to ask a very basic question about this. Like, uh, by what way we can ascertain the accuracy, the projecting accuracy of the models? We'll be talking more about that, but if you just run a model and see the results, you can't. So what what you can do is that, that you, you take the uncertainties, uh, at least in the data, um, and then you, 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 you don't use just one series of data. You use a range, an ensemble of, of data that represent the uncertainty in this, which we're going to talk more about tomorrow also. And then you take all this data and send through the model, so you don't get one result, but you get, again, an ensemble of, of results that are uh, uh, representing then uh, how the, the uncertainty in the input data will then translate into uncertainty in the output. And that's often a very good idea because um, 
well, well, partly for your, your client or whoever you're doing it for, you can then uh, sometimes show that, say you're forecasting a flood, uh, the central forecast does not say flood, but there's still a 10% because the high ones actually do, right? So maybe we should stay alert, right? Um, but also in other cases, you find that regardless of the uncertainty, you're still safe because maybe your, 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 your limit is up here, right? And all these are, are far below, right? So, so you, you can then even stronger uh, say that, conclude that, that this is not a problem. Okay. Um, do we go straight on with hydrology? Okay. On the adaptation, because we have, uh, I mean, one thing is the climate changes, but as mentioned, we can't stop it. It's going to continue. So what do we do about it? And adaptation is then the process or outcome of a process that leads to a reduction in harm or risk of harm or realization of benefits associated with climate change. Um, so the idea is how do we, realizing that climate is changing, how can we reduce the, the uh, adverse impacts of this? And there are, now I'm going to sit down for this. <coughs> there are basically two areas that we can work with. So we can start with, uh, with the supply side, you can say, supply of water, <coughs> um, by, by looking into additional uh, prospecting and extraction of groundwater. Maybe, so, maybe not so much in India, because groundwater use has been so abundant uh, all over the country for a long time. Uh, there, there are some areas where you, you could look into that with what we call conjunctive use um, of, of surface and groundwater. Uh, so areas where you have irrigated with surface water for a long time and, and groundwater has just been ignored more or less. There's actually a potential probably there to use groundwater more and in this way uh, save, save water on, so that the, uh, the need for surface water in those areas can be reduced in this way. Um, and this is, all this is related to drought, right? Uh, increasing the storage capacity by building more dams and reservoirs, often though also an issue which is not so easy. Uh, many parts of the world have built the, the dams that they easily could get approved, you can say, and now with environmental issues and funding and this and that, it's not so easy just to put up another reservoir. Right? Um, you can desalinate seawater, and that is much cheaper now than it was just 10 years ago, but uh, still not cheap. I mean, still quite expensive. And, and once you've done that, that water is still at sea level, so if you need it to irrigate uh, up in the hills, you need to pump it, right? So it's not, it's not like it's going to be a really viable solution on large scale. Rainwater storage was mentioned earlier, uh, and something that Jamia apparently is, is also working with here that you're harvesting the rainwater, right? And uh, can, you can act, if, if, it's not, if it's not done in a given area, just starting to do this can actually make a big difference. In, uh, in northeastern Thailand, they've been doing it for decades or maybe even centuries. Uh, they have, what they do is that uh, just next to their houses, they, they have some, some jars built and these are two meters high and very wide and they're just constructed there. Um, so when, they, when it rains on the roof, they just, uh, I think they have a filter and then into these jars, and some have th three or four of these jars next to each other. So they collect maybe uh, 10 cubic meters of water during the monsoon, and then there's water for watering the gardens, vegetables, uh, just locally for, for, on small scale, but, but still an important resource. It's locally available. It doesn't cost anything or once you have the jar. Um, I think nobody drinks it. Uh, partly it washes off the roof and it's not that clean and then it sits there for a long time. And, and, but but for, for, for a few extra vegetables and so on, it's very useful. And it then reduces the demand for other water in those locations. Um, removing of uh, invasive vegetation um, can actually make a difference. In... Uh, in the Ivory Coast in Africa, I was working on a project in 1998, I think, on, on this water hyacinth and other plants that they 
I think you also have in India, the, uh, a plant that uh, originally came from South America and probably some Spanish or whatever who were there found it very beautiful. So they brought it back home and then they spread all over the world. And the only place in the world where it has a natural enemy is South America. Uh, so here in India and a lot in Africa and so on, they're all over the place. So lakes and rivers completely covered. Um, in this, uh, this area in the Ivory Coast, there was one reservoir which had been fully covered by these water hyacinths. Uh, and with this layer of plants, dust has started to settle on top of that. So actually small trees were now growing on the floating plants. So it looked like a field. And one day, the local people saw a small aeroplane coming down towards this reservoir and, and doing like this, right? And they were all waiting, <laughs> don't, don't, don't land. But luckily, they, they realized something was wrong, so they took off again, right? So, but the owner of that reservoir was claiming, this is costing me a lot of money because it increases the evaporation. Um, and it sounds a little strange. I mean, open water compared to fields. I mean, normally, uh, if you're, your pan evaporation, right? It evaporates more from the pan than it does from the field. And of course, plants are there, but can the plants actually evaporate more than if it was just an open water surface? So we decided to test that. Uh, there are three different types of these invasive uh, plants in, uh, in, the, in the Ivory Coast. So we took some large, uh, uh, actually pools, I think, for children to play in. The, they were like four meters in diameter and about a meter deep. So filled them with water. And then we had just water in one. We had the water hyacinth growing in one and the other plants in the other two. And then we monitored for three, four months the evaporation. And compared, so, so the water, of course, evaporated, just normal water evaporation. And the two water plants, the difference was within 5%. So probably nothing. But the water hyacinth, there was a difference. Any guess? No. It was 80% more than the open water. It was almost twice as much, which I thought was quite surprising, actually. I, my guess is, I mean, do, do you know the water hyacinth? It comes out like this. It, it goes up 20, 30 centimeters above the, uh, the water surface. So from this much water, there is a large surface area of plant. And if this is sucking up moisture, it can then feed that to the wind uh, more easily than just this piece of water. That's probably the explanation, I'm guessing. But, it turns out he was right, that dam owner, that it is costing him a lot of water to have, the, have those plants there. Okay. Um, yeah, water transfer. In China, we are seeing huge uh, constructions now moving water from these big rivers they have from one to another. And I know it's been discussed here in India also for, for decades, should we make some interbasin transfer of water? You can also do it on, on smaller scale. I mean, there are, uh, uh, there's a reservoir in, uh, I think it was MP that we worked with under, under this DSS planning, which uh, was often uh, running out of water in the, in, the, in the wet season or in general, um, while a neighboring reservoir was spilling. Right? So the idea was, could you, could, you, could you make a channel from the spilling reservoir that just before it spills, it will then spill into that channel instead and then run over to, and fill up the, the, the suffering reservoir, you could say. And, and you can easily model that kind of thing and find out how big should the channel be and how much benefit do you do from that. So on smaller scale, I think it's definitely possible um, to do that. So on the supply side, there are different uh, options. On demand side, there's also different things you can do. Um, starting by by improving the efficiency um, and by re recycling water, it says here. Um, but, but also, um, I mean, in, in, many, in many towns uh, around the world, including India, the, the water distribution network is horrible. I mean, you, you have the amount of water that re is supplied to the town on, on, on la large scale, half of that perhaps disappears into the ground because all the pipes are leaking. Right? 
Um, so you have, maybe you have even spent time not only collecting it, but treating it, and then sending in these pipes, and then it just disappears. Right? So a lot can be gained by, by stopping this non-revenue water, as it's called, and, and uh, repairing your, uh, your pipeline. Um, but, but also to, to reuse it. Um, in uh, the Pune city, we were working with, uh, with the authorities a bit to look into this. Uh, they have uh, four reservoirs, Katagwasla complex, which was set up for, um, for irrigation originally, but is now also supplying a lot of water to Pune city. And everybody wants more water. So, so one of the discussions with the city was that, okay, we will, we will supply what you want, but then you make sure that you then return at least 60% downstream for irrigation in a quality that can be used for irrigation. So they need to stop their leakage and they need to ensure that their sewage water is treated for at least so that it's suitable for irrigation and then they could have the water right. So that was kind of the, the uh, agreement there. You can reduce um, irrigation demands by more uh, efficient ways of irrigating. And in some areas, they can be very efficient, actually. I mean, so that the losses are reduced. What, one thing that is maybe not always considered is that if, uh, if on the upstream irrigation scheme, you increase the efficiency a lot, then the drainage from that area is also reduced. So the next irrigation scheme has less water. But, but that is also there. Um, yeah. Then there's virtual water, as it's called, that instead of growing your own crops in your own state or your own country, uh, then if there's another state somewhere with, with abundant water and good facilities, let them produce the food and then we buy it. Right? There are a lot of governments around the world who doesn't like that idea because maybe if there's a war in 10 years with that country and we are completely reliant on, on them, you know, and that's a pity. I mean, and, and wars are not that frequent. And, and maybe you can uh, find some kind of arrangement to do this anyway. Maybe you say, okay, we'll buy your food, but then you produce energy produced by, from us. And if you stop the food, we stop the, you know. But you have some, some tools like that, right? Uh, the Soviet Union was not a good idea, but, but in two of these countries, uh, I forgot which, there was uh, reservoirs in, the, in, in one country upstream and then uh, fields to be irrigated in the downstream. And all the reservoirs were installed with hydropower, so they would uh, send the water through the power plants and down at the time when the water was needed for irrigation. Then Soviet Union split up, and these are now two different countries. So the upstream country, they produce hydropower when they need the power which they do in winter when it's cold, so they produce uh, heating with the power. So they send all this water down in winter, flooding the fields downstream, right? And in summer, there's no water. So the downstream country has lost uh, because they're no longer one country, right? you could say. Um, but virtual water uh, is probably a good idea in many parts of the world that you, you stop producing rice, if you don't have enough water, you buy the rice and then you produce something that, that is not so uh, water demanding for, uh, and sell that and you use the money to buy your rice from somewhere else. Um, yeah, rainwater harvesting, we talked a bit about that, so indigenous practices for water use could be part of that. Um, expanding the water markets. Uh, I think you all know the concept of integrated water resources management, which uh, is promoted, and I think most countries in the world have decided we are going for this. This is, uh, this is based on principles of, um, of, of water use. One of them is that water should be managed at the lowest appropriate level. And that means that if you have a village with a local well, the government shouldn't, the national government shouldn't decide what they do. The village should decide how do, we, uh, how do we manage our local water? It doesn't harm anybody. We have our local wells uh, where we take groundwater. Um, if it's polluted, we pollute it, and it's our problem, basically. And we should feel responsible. There are countries in Africa where the president has said, water for my people. So free wells have been set up, and free everything has been set up. But then when it's not working, they call the president and say, your well is not working, sir. Right, come and fix it. 
you, you need to have, you need to feel that responsibility that this is ours and, and you manage it locally, as long as it doesn't harm anybody. So if you're talking about an international river, the lowest appropriate level is a, an organization on that basin level that discusses how do we handle this, right? I know it's happening in India. There's a, uh, there's a project coming up under, under NHP now on Godavari and Krishna and Mahanadi on, on how do we handle water in these rivers. And, and the, uh, um, the organizations running these projects will partly be Central Water Commission, but also all the states. So they will jointly uh, run this, which involves modeling and, and planning and so on um, on these. But, but some of these principles on water management, one is women should have a higher say, actually. I don't know whether you are aware of this, that, that uh, it shouldn't be all these men deciding always, because often, who handles the water in the house, right? Who makes sure there's clean water for the kids and so on? It's the women, right? So, so maybe we should take that advice. Um, but also that water should have a value. The value of water should be recognized, right? Um, that sometimes you could actually use economical principles to decide what is the best use of this water. Of course, you cannot do it blindly. The poor people need drinking water, and they don't have to pay for. They shouldn't need to pay for that, right? Um, so, but but recognizing the value of water can often be used as a tool when you don't have enough to decide. Well, how do we actually manage this? And which of these many demands that are there are actually more important than others? Um, then economic incentives, metering and pricing can also be used to in, encourage a reduction in, in use. In, in Denmark, where I come from, it's quite expensive to have water, but the, the price is then divided in what does it cost to have the water supplied to your house and what does it cost to treat it again after it passed your house. Uh, almost none of it stays, right? So when you, you reduce water for washing and whatever, it all goes back into the sewer. And that part of the bill is actually higher. I think it's 60% compared to the uh, supply of water. But we have a lot of incentive in Denmark to uh, reduce our consumption. On, on climate adaptation, well, there are basically structural measures and non-structural measures. So the structural are things like building dikes and polders, flood diversion, you could make reservoirs, control gates, and so on. To, uh, to do that. On the non-structural, uh, part of it is zoning control. So you, if you make flood zones, where are floods likely to occur? And then uh, limit the, uh, the construction in those areas so that the potential damage is reduced. Yeah, regulating the flood plane. You can, and flood proving is a part of that. Flood forecasting has turned out to be very efficient. I'll talk more about that in a few days. You can optimize the way that reservoirs and other structures are, are operated, and then you can increase the flood preparedness. Um, yeah, and I will also get back to that in a few years. Flood insurance is also a possibility. Um, yeah, going through, I think we discussed this a bit, from the global projections to the regional to the hydrological local assessment, and then evaluating these different uh, measures. So, so this is basically a question of applying uh, models uh, using uh, data from the future, you could say, to see how, how does these different measures, how will they work in, in 50 years or in 100 years from now. Um, yeah. Let me come with an example here a bit from the Nile River, um, which we'll also get back to. Are you, are you getting tired? No, it's still awake. That's, uh, okay. Right, on the Nile River, um, we've had several projects on that river recently. It's, uh, I will, we'll go through it on the map, but they have a, lot, a number of, of challenges related to climate change there. <coughs> um, of course, there's the uncertainty on the future climate. The land degradation, which is taking place, and the river flow uh, changes. Flooding, though, increases. Siltation is a big problem there, and many others of, of the sort of the standard problems. Um, the Nile River runs from south to north in Africa, and here is Lake Victoria, which is a relatively wet area. Uh, different countries are surrounding it. 
Um, so from that lake, it spills out into the river, runs, runs through a, a wetland area here, and then into Sudan and Egypt, which are very dry countries. Uh, additional water comes from Ethiopia down uh, these branches here, and then, and then up here. Egypt, I think, is probably the richest, or at least the largest of these countries. And Egypt, you have know, probably heard in history, uh, and it's, it's set up and operated by by the countries uh, up here, but, but there's a treaty with, with Egypt that allows them to sit there and check that they're actually releasing what we have agreed. And these, the only thing these two persons do is sit there and monitor that they actually uh, follow the rules. Right? And for, for decades, it was impossible to change any of that. Once you had made a political agreement, nothing could be changed. Whether the change, climate changes, whatever changes, then nobody, particularly Egypt, would not accept anything. We'll get back to that. But <coughs> all these countries are sharing it still with, um, um, so 11 countries by now. And it's quite uh, diverse. Three million cubic meter, uh, square kilometer of, uh, of catchment area, almost 7,000 meters long. So. The rainfall generally occurs in this part of, of, of Africa with the uh, Lake Victoria here and Egypt there, and then, as mentioned, very dry uh, up here. Um, yeah, so different variations where the White Nile, as it's called, which is coming, which is this one from Lake Victoria, the Blue Nile, which is producing most of the water actually, and then a small one called uh, Afbara also. And now it died. What happened here? Ah. <coughs> um, so we have uh, the, the population showing here, um, we, where of course in these dry areas you have you have a very very low population, um, a lot in Ethiopia and, and particularly down in, in Egypt along the, the Nile Delta is very densely populated. Uh, so four of the basins, 11 countries, uh, have a population growth uh, which is in the top 10 globally. So the population is really increasing dramatically. Uh, nine are above the mean growth rates for Africa and all above the global. So that we really have a, a, an intense increase in population. So here again, let me take the mouse this time. Um, here again we worked on the, with the climate change. So starting with with the global or regional climate models uh, down to the overall catchments regionally, and then also looking locally into minor catchment areas and, and local measures. Uh, so working at all these different scales with, with meteorological partners to look into how can you then address some of all these uh, problems there. Um, yeah, with, with the Hadley Center for Climate Models <coughs> for the downscaling and using again ensembles, so there were 17 different ensembles, but it was decided then to reduce this to five, also for, for practical reasons. Uh, so five quite representative ensembles, uh, reaching from, from, uh, from low to high. <coughs> but based on all that, it was still possible to come up with some <coughs> consensus of what is the likely change in, in the climate um, in these areas. And, and, uh, and the amount of water would, which is likely to be available in the future to, to, to look into. <coughs> so you had increased flow in some locations, increased water scarcity in, in others.